thanks to all of you for coming back and we appreciate your patience as we get this going. This is part two of two weekends to talk about the clinical reasoning and spine pain process and shifting from a biomedical way of thinking more towards a biopsychosocial way of thinking in our approach to spine related disorders. Feel free to stop me any, at any point during the course of, of the talk if you have a question. I would much rather that we address those questions right when they come up so that the information, the confused information isn't carried down further down the line. So please stop me if you have any questions or issues you'd like to go over. Um, again, in full disclosure, this is my background, my biases that I bring. I covered them on the previous weekend. If there's anything you'd like to know more about, I, I'll be happy to discuss it. I will be talking about the physician quality reporting system just because it's it's so important and what's being done with it. Now our plan for this weekend is to start out by talking about the first a, a few loose ends that we need to finish discussing, then get right into the clinical reasoning in spine pain for the cervical spine. What we covered last weekend relative to the lumbopelvic spine, we're gonna address now relative to the cervical spine. We'll talk about that process first from a diagnostic standpoint and then from a treatment standpoint. After we talk about that, I'll spend a bit of time talking about this issue of vertebrobasilar stroke and cervical manipulation because there's so much misinformation about that subject and hopefully we can clear up a lot of the confusion relative to it. And then we'll spend the end of the day actually going through a case study of the cervical spine and see how it relates to what we just discussed on the three essential questions of the clinical reasoning and spine pain process. And we'll have a couple of breaks, one in the morning, one in the afternoon. And then in the morning. Um, tomorrow, we'll actually start out by talking about classification models for spine pain. If you remember, this clinical reasoning in spine pain is a classification model. That's the way it was intended and designed. By classification model, it's really a way to categorize patients, to subgroup patients so that it directs treatment, so that it guides decision-making relative to what are the best treatment approaches, what are, what are gonna give me the most consistent, the most predictable, and the best outcomes from a treatment standpoint. That's why we classify it, why we subcategorize patients. Um, after that, we'll talk a little bit about models to help coordinate care. What are some of the things that you can do that help you in dialoguing with other professions, dialoguing with your patients? Then we'll spend some time talking about imaging as it relates to spine pain with an emphasis upon cervical spine. And then very briefly, because there really isn't a whole lot of evidence here, talk about treatment dosage. How much is the right amount? And, and given the fact that we don't have a lot of evidence in that realm, how can we overcome some of the obstacles and still practice in a very patient-centered, evidence-based framework? And then at the end, tomorrow afternoon, we'll spend time going through a few case studies and talk specifically about how all of this information gets tied together. What are some of the big challenges we all face in practicing in the spine world, and how can we overcome a lot of those? And most importantly, perhaps, is this idea of translating evidence into clinical practice. So the key, if, if this becomes an exercise in academia, it's a waste of all of our time. Mine standing up here speaking and yours listening. If we can't take this information and actually have it create a bit of a shift in the way you're approaching patient care so that it becomes more predictable, more consistent, more patient-centered, more evidence-based. If we can't do those things, then, then we need to change what we're doing. So an interesting thing relative to this, we haven't looked at compliance with either the physiotherapists or the chiropractors or the medical physicians who, or the nurse practitioners or the physician's assistants who we've put through some of this training. But that's why we're doing this patient attitude and belief survey is with the supposition that first, 
if we can see a shift in the way people are thinking about spine pain, then we're going to make the assumption that the behaviors are going to go accordingly. Then we can also use some indirect outcome measures to see if they are reflective of that kind of a change. So is there a change in the number of patients who are being sent for plain film imaging? Is there a change in the number of spine patients who are being sent for advanced imaging studies or specialty consults? And we're actually, actually from around the country, we're seeing that kind of a data set now from, from just this kind of a program. So that is somewhat indirect evidence that it, it actually is taking best evidence and translating it into clinical practice. So we're really excited about that and we're actually writing up a bunch of that data. <coughs> Again, just to reiterate, there's gonna be a, a bit of redundancy in some of the things I'm saying. We like to think that it's very intentional redundancy, that we're trying to emphasize certain points so if we have to say them three or four times, bear with me, it's intentional because we really want to drive home certain key ideas here. And, and I would really appreciate feedback on them. An issue that came up when I was teaching in South Africa, and it didn't come out till the end of the second day of that weekend. And, and a doc, thank goodness, had the courage to raise his hand and say, I, I can't tell the psychologist I'm doing cognitive behavioral therapy, and I don't even understand what acceptance commitment therapy is. And, and that was my fault for not really making it clear to him that I am not asking you to, to become cognitive behavioral therapist, nor to practice cognitive behavioral therapy, nor to schedule a time with your patient to engage in cognitive behavioral therapy. Even with motivational interviewing, that's not the principle that we're promoting here. What we're asking you to do is understand those concepts and to contextualize the principles of those contexts into each and every encounter you have with that patient. So you're not going to schedule a time to do cognitive behavioral therapy. You're gonna understand the underlying principles of cognitive behavioral therapy. And every time you meet with that patient, you'll utilize some of those principles. You'll, you'll avoid catastrophizing language. You'll use language that empowers the patient and helps build their self-efficacy in their ability to manage and control. You'll help give them some active coping ex, um, activities. You'll help them to explore their ambivalence about change. Well, if I change, this is the good part, but here's the bad part. And you can do all that in a usual time slot allotted for an office visit. It doesn't have to be cumbersome either in the assessment of a lot of those issues or in the incorporation of those as management strategies. So it's really important that this information does get translated into clinical practice. And again, this isn't a technique course. This isn't about chiropractic. This isn't about physical therapy. It's about bringing a patient-centered best evidence program to the evaluation and management of spine-related disorders because as we spent the whole first day last weekend saying, it's an enormous economic burden. Hundred, almost $100 billion a year in the US alone. It's equally a seriously important problem relative to disability and impairment. S some economists suggest one to five times as expensive as the direct cost to manage the disability and impairment. Um, we are seeing an exorbitant increase in, in what are probably unnecessary and in many cases inappropriate interventions, be they epidural steroid injections used in a non-evidence-based way, the opiate epidemic that the United States is facing relative to pain control, and the use of advanced imaging when it doesn't change the course of care at all. It is not a technique seminar on manipulation. It is not a technique seminar on McKenzie protocol, nor on neuromobilization, neuroflossing. We assume you either have or can get 
that skill set. And if you don't have it, if you're a physical therapist and you've had very limited engagement with manipulative techniques, we strongly suggest you go get some additional training in those techniques. If you're a chiropractor and you've got very limited exposure to McKenzie protocol, there are plenty of postgraduate programs to help you get that skill set. If you're more from a medical background in PT and NP, then get some additional training in manual therapy techniques. Um, those are the skills that you can get outside. This is about trying to bring all those skills together into a more unified framework and package. So we're teaching about a new role, the primary spine practitioner. The need for the new role has been, been defined by this enormous burden that spine presents. And by the way, it's a, as I mentioned, it's a global phenomena. They face all the same problems in South Africa. Uh, we've lectured in Spain, South Africa, England. Hopefully next we'll be going to some of the Scandinavian countries to talk. But everybody's facing the same kind of a problem relative to spine care. And this, isn't, this is about enhancing the skills that you already have and that you are really already very good at. And a key element here is this shift away from an isolated practitioner doing their own thing, what's been referred to as the cowboy out riding the range, and help us function better as a team so that we can become, as Atul Gawande described, a NASCAR pit crew. Everybody knows their job, everybody does it effectively and efficiently, and we work together as a team. And I, the other metaphor I really like in this regard is this idea of silo-based care, that we all work, tend to work in our own silos, and it's time to break the walls of the silos down and see where the overlap is and where we can support each other in the work that we're doing for these patients. Um, the texts that we recommend are clinical reasoning and spine pain for lumbar spine, clinical reasoning and spine pain for cervical spine. They can both, they're both soft cover books, can be purchased on uh, Amazon. Um, the South African group uh, all contacted uh, the author, lead author of this, Don Murphy, and they're really pushing him to make this an e-book. <laughs> so um, they're hoping that he will go that route. Right now he's not, but they're really hoping he'll go that route, which would just make getting the book a whole lot easier. Good. Any questions just on that simple background? All right. That said, let's just tie up a few loose ends that didn't quite fit anywhere else. There's actually a band, the loose ends. And again, I'll start as I do pretty much every lecture I ever give with this quotation from Voltaire, the only purpose of the physician in, is to amuse the patient while nature cures the disease, uh, we can expedite the process. In spite of the truth behind Voltaire's statement, we can really expedite the process. This was from that textbook I mentioned, The Social Transformation of American Medicine, which is a historical, a sociological perspective on the history of allopathic medicine in the United States from about the mid-1800s till 1982, and the book was published um, by Paul Starr, and he has a great quotation. Science worked even greater changes on the imagination than it worked on the process of disease. And this is kind of the, the risk we run in today's environment with high tech. We expect that high tech is going to save our system. So that if we can only develop a new high-tech procedure or a new high-tech diagnostic test, then that's going to save us. And we've learned, certainly in spine care, that it hasn't at all. In spite of the enormous advantages that advanced imaging like magnetic, magnetic resonance imaging brings to the delivery of spine care, it's probably created as many problems as it's helped solve. Um, so we need to be much more selective in the judici judicious use of some of those tools and not expect that they are going to be the saving grace. We have to keep it patient-centered, keep it evidence-based, and be, maintain critical thinking in the way we approach a lot of this. So very brief overview, which we've covered last time on lumbar spine. 
the three essential questions? Do the presenting findings suggest that there's serious underlying disease, what we would classify as a red flag? Can we, within the confines of best evidence, define the tissue that's predominantly involved here? And third, can we identify any variables which could be perpetuating this problem? What's feeding into it that cause it to, to go on? We tend to do really good historically, and most of our schooling is really focusing on questions one and two, with very often very little attention paid to question number three. So if we emphasize question number three over and over and over again, it's intentional. It's because it's the area we've been given the least background and training on. And I, again, mentioned these points last time, but I'm going to reiterate them again. And these are some of the key variables. Whatever the outcome measure that you decide to select, make sure you apply these principles to that outcome tool. Is it a useful tool? Is it reliable? Is it valid? Does it actually measure what it purports to measure? And then within validity, you can look at things like sens sensitivity and specificity. How good is it at detecting everybody who has the disease? How good it is it if it's positive telling you that, that with very high likelihood that is the disease that's going on? So we'll come back to these over and over again. And if you remember the, neg the acronym SNOWD and SPIN, a sensitive test is negative, it rules a condition out. If a specific, specific test is positive, it rules a condition in, but the converse is not true. If a sensitive test is positive, it doesn't really help you. If a specific test um, is negative, it doesn't really help you. And then the kinds of outcome measures that you utilize. Process measures, as the name suggests, is did you follow a process? Did you do steps A, B, C, and D? The back pain recognition program from NCQA was largely just a process-driven way to measure quality. Clinical measures are what we typically think of as, as our um, orthopedic tests, neurological testing, but also includes what used to be called soft data, but looks like it's the most valid and reliable, and that's a lot of the questionnaires that we use, like the neck disability index in this kind, which is the counterpart to a Swestry for low back. Um, psychological measures, and there are a multitude of, of them out there, we want you to probably start with the simplest ones, like a depression scale, like the PHQ-9, um, because that's probably one of the most common psychological issues associated with spine-related pain. Um, satisfaction and including alongside that the patient-directed um, instruments. So a satisfaction scale tells you, is the patient happy with care? A patient-directed instrument would be something that asks the patient specifically, what do you most want to return to that you can't do now because of your problem. And the original one that Bogduck, Bogduck developed included four questions, and we started using it the way he wrote it. And I don't know if any of you, do, do any of you use that? Do you ask that as a part of your workup? What do you most want to get back to? I, I've never had anyone give me more than two. So we stopped and just say, even if you give us one, maybe two, but no one has ever come up with with four. Um, and then cost measures, just because of this transparency that's starting to develop in healthcare. Patients are starting to know what an MRI costs. Um, with high deductible plans, they now very much care what an office visit costs. Because up until they hit their deductible, they're going to be paying all of that out of pocket or from a health savings account. And then adverse events. We historically tend to think of adverse events being tracked only in research protocol. But there are some um, um, tracking groups that are starting to look at adverse, adverse events on a, on a more global perspective. Certainly in the surgical realm of spine, when they develop these registries, where they're tracking everything from patient demographics to the type of surgery done to the type of hardware used, um, they're also tracking 
um, outcome measures and complications and adverse events. Um, I want to very briefly go into a little bit about the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services, and you can look this up at cms.gov, on the physician quality reporting system. It's been going for a few years now. There was some question about will it persist as is or will it be melded in? There's a new uh, MIPS. Um, it, it's, a, it's a new way to track reimbursement as it's related to some of these quality measures. And so there's some suggestion that these physician quality reporting system and meaningful use might all be tied in together in, in a new reporting system. Um, are any of you doing PQRS reporting right now? Yeah? Okay, good, good. If you don't, or if you have not, say, two years ago, then you'll be penalized this year. And for every year you don't engage, there is an additional bit more of a penalty. So Medicare will actually be withholding some of your reimbursement based on whether you did or did not participate in PQRS. And there's about a one to two year delay from when you participate to when you get penalized. It's a very simple reporting methodology that's utilized on the Part B Medicare claims. If you are part, of, this is the part, if you are part of a national registry or participating in meaningful use reporting, say with an electronic health record, they're gonna probably fold this into that so you won't have to do two reporting, two reports. It's probably biggest impact, are any of you hospital-based in physiotherapy? Because that, or even chiropractic actually, that's where the meaningful use and the EHR reporting will probably tie this information in. Great. Um, these are just a couple of the quality metrics that have been utilized both within physiotherapy and in chiropractic. And the committee I sit on has medical doctors and chiropractors and physical therapists all sitting together to try to develop these metrics and how they're utilized. So one of them is measure number 131 and it's for pain assessment. So it's the percentage of patients aged 18 and older with documentation of a pain, pain assessment using a standardized tool like a numerical rating scale or a visual analog scale on each visit. So this one is meant to be measured each and every visit you have with the patient and documentation of some follow-up if they score anything other than zero. So to meet the metric, you have to do pain reporting using a standardized tool every visit. It can actually be even just asking the pain how patient, how bad is your pain on a zero to 10 scale? And it has to be documented in the chart on every visit and you have to put a follow-up plan of what you're gonna do about it um, where it specifically addresses the pain issue. A second measure is 182 function assessment. And again, for patients 18 years of age and older with documentation of a functional outcome assessment using a standard, standardized tool. So it has to be, a, I mean, they really give you broad leeway in which tool you use, but it needs to have some evidence base behind it, like a Roland Morris Activity Scale or an Eswestri Disability Index or um, Promise or Photo, something that has a function measure or Short Form 36 has a function measure associated with it. And you, um, you have to include the date you did it and documentation of a care plan based on the identified functional deficits so that you're making your care plan specifically to address the functional uh, deficits that have been identified with the tool. This one typically is done every, at every reassessment with a minimum that it's done every four weeks. So if you reassess at two weeks, then it's expected you'll do it at two weeks. If you've not done a reassessment, you have to do it within four. Um, there are exceptions. You're allowed not to have to administer, and there's a specific code to address these, if for some reason, although I can't imagine why, asking the patient the question would jeopardize their health 
because they need to be somewhere else more quickly. Same for pain and function. If the patient refuses to fill it out, there's actually a code um, um, to list that. Or if there's some severe mental or physical issue with the patient that they're not able to answer the question. So that's PQRS reporting. Um, clinical measures, you know, we have a variety of them at our disposal, pain, function, range of motion, orthopedic tests, neurological tests. There's challenges associated with each of these. You know, neurological testing in most spine pain patients is gonna be normal. Um, orthopedic testing is somewhat problematic when the tests are used in isolation because very often we haven't done validity studies with these and, and in some cases not even reliability studies with them. Um, Josh Cleland, who's a physiotherapist and a PhD, um, has written a wonderful book that has pretty much done a summary of palpation range of motion and orthopedic testing for every region of the body and then summarized where there is validity data, what it shows, where there is um, reliability data, what it shows. So it's a great, great reference text. Anybody remember the name of the book by Cleland? I can't remember. I'll, I'll look it up and, and get that information back to you. But that's really, I think, one of the better and really succinct reference tools you can use to help you address this issue of, of orthopedic testing, palpation, and range of motion. Um, a common tool we're advocating you all consider incorporating into your practice is for the low back, the start back nine tool. And for the neck, it's, we're referring to it as the neck pain nine tool. We, we've been in conversation with the people from Keele University um, and they don't want us to call this the, the start neck. They said, just call it the neck pain tool. They aren't at all opposed to it. Um, and we hope to test the reliability and eventually the validity of this tool. If you remember the start back tool, it's a predictor of what? Somebody say. Risk of chronicity. Right, it's not specifically meant to be used as an outcome tool. It's a predictor of the risk of chronicity. So the way, if you read the paper, the way the tool was developed was they did two questions just specifically about pain. The first two questions on start back. We're just asking questions about pain. And because outcomes are a little worse if you have pain in the low back, also in the neck, it works vice versa. If you have pain in the neck, but also in the low back, then prognosis is a little bit worse. So that's why they asked those two, first two questions about pain. The third and fourth questions are function questions. And on the start back tool, they took them off a valid low back functional tool, the Roland Morris um, Disability Index. So what I did is just pull two questions off the neck disability index, which is a validated tool for neck pain. Questions five through nine are all on psychosocial measures, um, and they are all just part of evaluating psychosocial uh, issues related to their, their spine pain. So I left those the same, but where it said back, just changed it to neck. And, and so we hope that we can eventually test the reliability and validity of this, but it was constructed just as a counterpart to the start back tool and we've been using it in that way and scoring it exactly the same. Um, and you can see the first eight questions are just dichotomous, yes, no kinds of things. Nine is a little bit more of a Likert scale, but the first three choices on question nine would score zero, like a no or a disagree. The last two choices would be the same as if you put an agree. So you get a total score here out of nine. There's also the six item tool. So. From a, from a differentiating standpoint, the nine item tool will allow you to differentiate low risk, medium risk, and high risk. The six item tool just says very little or no risk or some risk. So it's even simpler, it's only six questions um, and, and looks very similar. 
Another outcome tool that really is useful is, and again, we haven't yet tested the reliability and validity of this. It has face validity only in that we pulled the questions off validated questionnaires. So there's a question on um, confidence and ability to overcome the problem. There's a question on depression and two coping questions. And so it becomes a very simple tool to help you look for psychosocial overlay issues. What we don't have and, and becomes, as we said, you're practicing in the gray area um, when you're a clinician in any field. There's a lot that's not known that you have to be comfortable with so that you don't become very dogmatic in your approach. What we don't have is a threshold for when these are really most meaningful, right? So if you score a four or you score a six, at what point is that really something that you might want to call in, say, a clinical psychologist? What's the threshold? Nobody knows. And I've had this conversation with clinical psychologists and it's a judgment call. So you'll have to see what you're comfortable with and, and how you can incorporate that. At the very least, you give it to the patient, you apply your intervention for two to four weeks and repeat it and see if there's change. Um, satisfaction measures, how many of you measure patient satisfaction in your office on a regular basis? Just raise your hands. So I can see, okay. You all should be doing it periodically. You all should be doing it. The only caveat is don't ask the patient a question that you can't do anything about. Because if you do, then you're just setting yourself up for disaster. Do we have enough parking? But you can't change how much parking is in your office. Then they're gonna wonder why you didn't address the issues they have a problem with. Um, on our website, Spine Care Partners, there's a section just where it says PSPN and forms. Um, we're, we have all these forms available. You can go right to the website there and just download them all. And it shows how to score the Start Back tool. And we'll, if we don't have it, we'll put the link to PHQ and, and a couple of the others that are all, these are all open access. Um, We've talked about this previously and as an outcome measure, costs, direct being the cost to pay for the care, indirect being all those associated with lost productivity, disability, and, and so on. And that value is the, the sweet spot. Value is getting the best outcome you can get at the best cost. Um, are any of you familiar with qualities or had any background in research where they were looking at qualities? Quality is a quality adjusted life year. And what it is is how much does it cost to get one additional year of improved or quality function? 